people that ask me for several years, if I believe in a lost Dutchman mine, that is a very difficult question to answer because over the years um, I've heard so many stories. And for the past 25 to 30 years, I've spent most of my time, at least free time, researching the subject of Jacob Waltz, the Superstition Mountains, and the Lost Dutchman Mine. And to determine whether there is a Lost Dutchman Mine, this is very difficult, simply because there is so much fact and fiction entwined, and it's so difficult to separate the two. Now, there's one thing in my research I've been able to determine, and that is that Jacob Waltz indeed did exist. He arrived in Prescott, Arizona in 1863 with the Walker Party, and it was there that he staked some claims uh, in the Walker Mining District and in the Turkey Creek Mining District, and also in the Walnut Grove Mining District. He staked three claims, actually. There was the Gross Claim that he staked in 1863, I believe it was on September 21st. Then he staked another claim called the General Grant and another one called the Big Rebel. And uh, his success there was very limited and he finally gave up his prospecting activities in around the Prescott area and then he moved to Phoenix and homesteaded uh, on the north bank of the Salt River. Uh, this 160 acre parcel of land that he had he farmed, and then during the winter months, when the opportunity presented itself, he went into the mountains looking for another gold vein. He had not given up becoming rich on gold. In fact, uh, Waltz applied for his citizenship when he was in Natchez, Mississippi. At least he presented a letter of intent at the Adams County Courthouse on November 12, 1848. Of course, at that time, he did not get his citizenship, and then he traveled on to California and the gold fields of that area, and then on July 19, 1861, he applied for naturalization and obtained it. Therefore, Waltz knew he was now prepared to search for gold, and if he found any gold, he could stake a claim on it, and it would be his. Well, he started prospecting in the superstition areas. This is believed by a lot of people. One fact that kind of supports his theory is that he knew Elijah M. Rivas known as the Hermit of Superstition Mountain. Now, Rivas moved into the superstitions, uh, into the eastern part of it, in 1872. And Waltz was still going into the mountains, probably as late as 1878 and maybe even later. Uh, therefore, this provided sort of a hearsay documentation that Waltz would first have a reason to be in the superstitions. Many old-timers claim that Waltz and Rebus did a lot of prospecting together in the superstitions. So you can see I've really delved into this subject, and I have tried to trace Waltz from the day he arrived in the United States until the date of his death, October the 25th, 1891, in Phoenix, Arizona. When he died, there were two people, at least in the house momentarily, before he actually uh, passed away. This was Julia Thomas and Reinhardt Petrash. Well, just a few minutes before his death, they rushed out into the town looking for the doctor. And while going out the door, they ran into Richard J. Holmes and Gideon Roberts. And they asked him if they would go into the house and look after old Waltz while they tried to find the doctor. Well, it's because of this that so many stories have been handed down concerning the Dutchman and his lost mind. A lot of people and old timers believe that Julia Thomas and Reinhard Petras received those final clues as to the location of his rich gold vein somewhere in the Superstition Mountains. And also, people believe that Petras passed this information on to his brother Herman. Then there's the other side of the story that Richard Holmes actually ended up with all the information because he ended up with the gold that was under Waltz's bed. Now this was very rich gold and it has been quite well documented and if it indeed did come from the Superstition Mountains it would indicate that somewhere in those mountains there was a very rich vein of gold. Well I have tried to look at this very objectively and scientifically. I've tried to really apply the scientific method and the research involved. 
Now you look at the superstition area geologically and what do you find? Basically it is extrusive igneous rock in that area. That means volcanic rock that was ejected from the earth through volcanic activity of some type, either large fissures or volcanic cones themselves. These flows were very massive in the superstitions. Some of them were very eruptive. In other words, very explosive type of eruptions. Uh, most of the rock that you find up there is either basalt or ash. Now this is not to say that an intrusion could not have occurred. If an intrusion had occurred, bringing magma to the surface or near the surface, and this magma was highly mineralized, then gold could be associated with it. Now this is one way that you can look at the possibilities that there might be a gold mine there. Well, in searching the superstitions for the past 35 years, I have never found a true intrusive vein that is extremely rich in any kind of mineralization. I have found indication, though, of a variety of fine intrusions associated with fault zones, uplifted areas, and area and pressure ridges back there. So when you start really studying the geology of the superstitions, from a prudent man's point of view, as a geologist, one could say that the area is not conducive to gold-bearing bodies of ore. But on the other hand, if you look at some of the recent geologic reports, one put out by the United States Geologic Survey involving what they call the Mercury Vapor Report. The Mercury Vapor Report indicates that within the superstitions, some of the richest ore, at least gold or heavy metals, is found in that area. But the surface geology does not indicate this. So evidently, if there are any rich heavy metals in the superstitions, they must be very deep-seated. Now, if that is true, then they could possibly intruded some of the tertiary volcanics there and were brought to the surface where a prospector could have possibly come across them or might have dug a shallow hole and come in contact with them. This is what makes the superstition such a unique geologic area. Waltz was quoted many times as saying that no miner or prospector would find his mine by looking at really the geology. In other words, what he was indicating there is that a prospector would look for gold where gold is found. But his mine is in a place that a prospector or a miner would even look for gold or even dream there was gold there. Maybe just in basic country rock or volcanic rock uh, of some type, particularly of igneous nature, basalt or ash. So there are some reasons to believe that Waltz could have had a mine. Now it seems that Julia Thomas handed down a clue that said somewhere at the northwest end of Superstition Mountain, Waltz went in there looking or working his gold mine. That is where Julia Thomas went in August of 1892. She didn't find Waltz's mine and neither did Richard Holmes or his son Brownie Holmes. But there have been many predecessors who have followed them. And I might say my dad was such a man. He searched for the Lost Dutchman Mine from about 1927 to about 1952. I haven't really followed in his footsteps because I have not been quite sure that such a fabulously rich body of ore could exist, or even a bonanza or glory hole. I've also had the tendency to believe that the gold fields was where Waltz may have found his gold. Waltz died in 1891. The rich strike at the Mammoth, well actually the Black Queen was made in 1892, and then the Mammoth Mine, which is the richest of all, was discovered in April of 1893. But the gold that came from Goldfield consistently was not at all similar to the gold that was found under the bed that Waltz died on. It's not the same gold that Richard J. Holmes sold to the Goldmans on Montezuma Street in Phoenix, which later was made into jewelry. So this would indicate that Waltz had a source of his gold ore that nobody has yet been able to determine. Now this is the fascinating thing about the Lost Dutchman mine itself. 
And actually, when you start talking about the Dutchman, one thing that should be mentioned is really, it's not the Dutchman was never lost. It, there's two things wrong right there. First place, it would have been the Dutchman's lost mine. The second place, Jacob Waltz was not a Dutchman. He was born in Germany, actually in Oberschwandorf. So these things, right at the beginning, the facts were accurate. But this was quite common in the early West, uh, by people getting their homelands confused, uh, by getting their names, their nationality, origin, was often confused by people. So this wasn't nothing uh, new and not really a problem in this legend itself. The problem with the legend is trying to determine exactly what facts are authentic and what facts are fictional. All right, let's examine the facts that exist on the Lost Dutchman Mine. Let's just look at the general ones. We start off, one of the first facts that has been handed down from one generation to another generation has been the story, or the statement you might say, that Walt supposedly made about a military trail. What he said was, from the entrance of my mind, I can see the military trail. But from the military trail, I cannot see my, my mind. What he was saying there was, there were soldiers in the area, evidently. And from their spot there, they could look up and couldn't see Waltz, but he could look down and see them. Now, if you look at all the military maps of this area in this period of time, you cannot find one military trail that can be documented traversing the superstition wilderness area, what we know as today the superstitions. So this would indicate that if Waltz actually seen soldiers in the superstition mountains, what he seen was a patrol going through. Now that's probably what he seen. Maybe a seven, eight, or ten man patrol. All right, there's another clue that Waltz left that a lot of people have always been interested in, and I, I explained that a little earlier is a point that a miner or a prospector would never look for the Lost Dutchman mine where it was actually located because it was not in rock that is conducive to gold. That's why. So that clue stands to reason. Another interesting clue pertaining to the Lost Dutchman mine is the clue about the trick in the trail. The origin of this uh, clue I don't know. It could be uh, the trashes. It could have been the homes. It could have been Waltz himself. What you're looking at basically is the fact that what kind of a trick was it? Was it a natural bridge you walked under? Was it a crevice? Was it a ledge? Uh, was it a cave? It could have been numerous things that was a trick in the trail. So his reference to a trick in the trail can be very complicated but you can pick your choice. Another thing, there was a face on the trail to his mind, a stone face. Well, there are hundreds of stone faces in the superstitions. They are only delimited by one's imagination. So that trick uh, and that type of a thing, or a stone face, uh, is as good as anybody's imagination could be. So you couldn't use that as a real civic crew. One of the important clues that always uh, stood out is a north trending or running canyon with a stone cabin in the head of it. That clue has been around for a long time. Now we could go over numerous clues on the Lost Dutchman Mine and I doubt very much that you will find it from that kind of information. People have been looking for a hundred years using these clues and still haven't been able to locate the Lost Dutchman Mine. But look, let's look at some other interesting facts surrounding this story. One is, a lot of people here in the 1930s and 40s said, oh, the Chamber of Commerce in Phoenix are the ones that devised the whole idea of the Lost Dutchman Mine. Well, the story of the first search for the Lost Dutchman Mine appeared in the Arizona Republican on December the 7th, 1895, almost 30 years before any Chamber of Commerce had been established in Arizona. So it wasn't a tourist attraction tale. The Lost Dutchman Mine was indeed here long before any attempts to persuade tourists to come to Arizona Territory or the state of Arizona after 1912. Well, we could go on with many clues, but this gives you some ideas. Now, 
How rich is this mine? Well, according to most information, the rich the mine is worth millions, twenty million dollars in gold. Some say two hundred million dollars of gold back there. Also, there's other stories as to what this gold mine was, and we can name many. I think the three scenarios that you hear most in the Apache Junction area or Arizona is one, the Lost Dutchman mine, the story of the Dutchman and his lost mine of superstition. Then you hear the story about the Peraltas, and there were supposed to be three brothers, Manuel, Ramon, and Miguel, and they discovered a rich vein of gold in the superstitions. They worked it and removed the gold, took it to Mexico, built a big hacienda, would come back and work it once in a while. And then in 1848, after the Mexican-American War, and Mexico lost its rights to this area, the Peraltas only came back one time to take as much gold as they could. They were attacked by the Apaches. They were murdered. Well, some years later, another Peralta came back, and either a friend or maybe a cousin, and they were working the mine, and Jacob Waltz allegedly came up on them, shot them, thinking they were Apaches, he said, and began to work their mine. That's how he may have found it. We do not know. But this is another story. Now, there are those who believe even another story, that when the Jesuits and the Franciscans and all of the religious groups in Mexico were fighting over the dominance of the mission field, the uh, Jesuits brought their church treasures and hid them in the superstitions to prevent the Mexican government or the Spanish government or the Franciscans from acquiring them, therefore providing another source of the rich gold that supposedly can be found in the Superstition Mountain. The stories are endless as far as the gold goes. I don't care what kind of a story you want, somebody will tell it to you this day and age. The separation of truth from fiction is almost impossible. It has also become a very basic format for a lot of fraud schemes over the years. And this is something that people should be very aware of when they're listening to stories about the mine, gold and the superstition. First thing you should ask somebody or find out, if they're asking for money, I wouldn't get involved in it unless it's an adventure where you're all three are going in and grub staking and going to hunt the mine together and enjoy a weekend adventure or a week adventure. There's no problem with that. But if you're dealing with a situation where you're investing large amounts of money in somebody else who claims they found the mine, you're probably dealing with some kind of a fraud scheme. So try to avoid those situations for sure. Well, people still ask me what do I think and do I believe there's a lost Dutchman mine? The idea of a lost Dutchman mine is a very, very nebulous thing. Uh, well, maybe I can phrase it this way. The lost Dutchman mine, to me, is kind of like this. It's not so much the finding as it is the searching for it. It gives an excuse to somebody like myself to go into the superstitions as frequently as I can just looking around. Whether I really believe there's a gold mine back there is really not important because the real treasure of the superstitions that I gain is going back there and enjoying the beauty of the desert, the mountains, and the characters and people I meet, watching the animals, watching a summer thunderstorm or a winter snowstorm. There's so many things that are really the true treasures of Superstition Mountain, and if I never find the gold mine, I will have really, really harvested the real treasure of superstition anyway. The gold is just a tangible economic thing that would probably bring problems and concerns for me for the rest of my life if I found a gold mine anyway. So my desire to find it is not near as great as my desire to enjoy looking for it. Maybe that's the best way to put it. I've known so many men and maybe Bob Corbin and I, in our many trips into the superstitions, he probably uh, emphasized the significance of searching for gold in the superstitions when one time we met an old prospector up in Tortilla Creek. We were two or three miles up the creek. I mean, it was rough. And we were on horseback fighting boulders and everything else, trying to get through to get over to Peter's Canyon. 
and we ran into an old man by the name of Carol Walsh. He was 83 years old. He was, had a big pack on his back, and he had a walker. I mean, he was so crippled up he had to use a walker to get around. He was by himself. Also, he's deaf as a post. He can't hear you almost unless he's looking right at you to talk to you. And when we stopped and got in front of him, started talking to him, uh, he was just as excited as he was 28 years ago when he made his first trip into the superstition. He was sure he knew where to go, where the mine was. And as we rode away, Bob said, and it's really a classic statement, he said, all the gold in the superstition mountains isn't worth being able, when I'm 87, to do something like that, or 83, he said. And I can see his point. If that spirit of searching for the lost Dutchman mine keeps a man going and young like that at his age, then it's worth all the gold and treasure in the world. And this has been the case with many old timers, and few, few people understand it. They don't really understand the value of a dream. And you know, we could talk about dreams for those that believe in the Lost Dutchman mind. Believe in that goal just like somebody who's very religious believes in God. And it keeps them alive, it keeps them searching, it keeps them looking. And I agree, sometimes a person could interpret that as a replacement, a deity in the place of God, just to search for that Lost Dutchman mind. There's many of them that have done it over the years. And they've created some really, really interesting stories. I could go on and on talking about the people and characters. Myself, I will still record the history. Sometimes I'll sit down and write about it. And uh, I'll still go into Superstition Mountains. And I'll never leave this desert because it's an area which I truly, truly love. There's nothing that compares with it, and especially with a heritage like the Lost Dutchman Mine to guide me through the many years which I plan to search these mountains. Thank you.